First of all, uh, this is uh, late in the evening, the second day of the conference. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for being here uh, physically and hopefully mentally. Um, well, before we get into what Phasen Angemessenheit is, uh, maybe a quick introduction. My name is Frederick. I'm uh, from Munich. I'm Konstantin, also live in Munich. Yes. And um, because we are in Prague, um, you may know the um, proverb, uh, carrying coal to Newcastle. That's what we did because we brought beer. And the people of you who have been to the last conference in Munich, you may recognize this beer. So it's the Pola Paulana, and it's actually the Oktoberfest beer. So there is no Oktoberfest this year for the second year in a row, but we still have the beer, and that's actually the grand prize. So you can win this beer. Now I have your attention. So we will split the group more or less here, and we will have, and I explain the rest afterwards, we will have two teams, Team Blue here, and Team Green here. Just remember, you are in a team and you can win beer. That's, for the start, that should be hopefully enough. So, Phasenangemessenheit. Uh, many people already ask me, is that actually a real word? Yes, it is. And when Konstantin and I did some, some research for the talk, we actually realized that the word face often refers to moon faces. So to be actually precise, what we want to talk about is Entwicklungsphasenangemessenheit. That's a lot, most of you probably would agree that this is actually precise. And um, just because we are here on our free time, I'm legally, I have to show this slide because all the presented opinions are Constantine and mine. And do not express the views or opinions of our employer. So. <laughs> Thank you. So, what we want to show you, and before we start the competition for the grand prize, what are faces, what's happening to the screen, I don't know. What is Phasenangemessenheit? Why is Phasenangemessenheit a thing? Can the benefits actually be achieved easier? And anti-patterns to look out for? And also, how does the release to customer cycle time actually influences these phases? So what you will learn is, first of all, understand the forces at play when it comes to phases and the resulting adoptions of the structures and processes. Then you will learn how to detect misunderstandings or hindering processes that may support phases. And you will understand the argumentation, why phases exist, and you hopefully learn about possible counter arguments when you are in a situation talking to people and phases come up. Okay? So let's start with the first one. So, what are phases? So, based on our experience, they usually describe the implementation of a product development process in a company, and they are typically derived from a process model, like BAH or StageGate. And they are targeted to facilitate or smoothen processes in a company, and they rather describe a timeline just before lunch or the expected environment for the teams, like it's the high-pressure phase. Or there's even, um, the many of you may know the Inside Apple book, and they refer to it as the death march. So that's a phase. So then have a look at an implementation example. You could have something like this, like a research and early prototyping phase, a development phase, a release phase, 
Usually the release phase is where the death march happens of some sort. And then you would have something like a maintenance and operation phase. Right, Constantine? Yes, and um, it might um, appear to you um, that this is, this might, or it looks like um, some sort of stage gate processes. And uh, stage gate processes were originally designed to make um, go or kill decisions or to ensure that uh, the product development is on track. And the main part of that was also to include actually everyone, including marketing, into the development of the product. And over the years, uh, the stage, stage gate process as such uh, was developed further, but most companies stayed with the pre-millennium uh, version of that and reduced it to a waterfall or sequential life cycle process, introduced more gates and um, yeah, basically came to a sequential life cycle process with uh, lots of gates and figured out that maybe for all of these uh, phases, we need different organizational structures and different processes, different people. And uh, this is, uh, our discussion goes into this direction. And this is where the actual topic of the talk comes into play. So, Phasen angemessenheit. So, we now have phases. So, our processes obviously need to be adequate to these phases, right? So, based on our experience, usually what is Phasen angemessenheit? that it assesses whether a method, a tool, action, process actually is applicable in the according phase. Can we really do that in the high pressure phase? Or do we actually need that? We are just doing a prototype, right? And it is usually used as a ratification to start or stop doing stuff, like events. Do we really need like the review, I mean, so close, high pressure, we need the time. And is understood by the management as a means to increase efficiency. And obviously, it does not increase efficiency and actually hinders learning. And um, the last one, and maybe obvious one, it piles up technical debt, like a lot. So that doesn't sound too good, so actually, why, are, uh, why is Phasen angemessenheit? Why is it a thing? So, phases are perceived as an integral part of the product, actually. So, hence, we cannot change them. The phases belong to the product. It's nothing that we do, it's part of the product. And there are actually positive effects, right? You can reduce processes, you can actually get things done, especially in a large organization. That's, that's good, and it's off, often the only way to somehow cope with whatever implementation of processes or, or, or model you are uh, dealing with in your company. So, some other positive effects maybe, uh, well, keeps process department busy, of course, and it fosters heroism. I save the process. I save the product because death march. But death march already implies that there is like, well, death. Um, and last but certainly not least, it's very easy to understand. We have to deliver. And you don't have to bother with all these books and papers and stuff like that. So faces anyone can understand. So what are anti-patterns to look out for? So imagine in your context, in your company, in your team, in your community, what should you look out for if you're not sure uh, if you're in a situation where phases are actually a thing? So typically, when you are organized around the product architecture, that is something that will, for sure, from our observation, foster like the existence of phases, and hence will sooner than later, um, well, you will be phasen angemessen at one point. Well, infrequent integration delivery on product level, that's certainly, um, if you do that very infrequent, 
welcome to faces. And then delayed feedback from like the company's customer representation or any kind of feedback. Imagine delivering something and then the actual feedback of, of people using that comes like weeks or even months later into your team. So you, that will somehow disrupt whatever process is at play. And obviously, um, lack of product vision and roadmap, and especially the alignment between the teams or the areas. If you don't have something where everybody can align, then one area or one team might start working on something that will be only relevant to another team like in a couple of weeks, or it has been relevant, but like three months ago, and now you're already somewhere completely somewhere else, right? And that will, well, bring some communication difficulties, and that's also something to look out for if you observe that, then you will probably have some sort of a phase going on. Yours. So, how does the release to customer cycle time actually influence those phases? Um, so, number one is uh, if the company is organized around uh, product architecture, uh, having huge, maybe not even teams, but huge component departments, and uh, it leads to the fact that in such situation, the integration frequency on an entire product level is usually slow. It's maybe a few times a year, for example. And uh, by doing this, um, by, by having such slow uh, integration cycles or infrequent uh, integration, um, those, those departments, they remain, they still exist, they don't have motivation to change. And the, all the people inside those departments, they don't have the motivation to go cross-component, cross-functional, uh, um, cross and so on. So when you try to adopt um, agility or to become adaptive inside, uh, inside such one department, you at some point hit the wall and say, okay, it, it doesn't, we cannot do any further. There is no motivation for us to be actually adaptive because we still have to release, like, I don't know, a few times a year in order to integrate with the other uh, departments together. And if, the, uh, if a company decides to shrink, to shorten the integration time on the whole product level, then um, there is motivation for everybody in the company to start thinking differently, to start becoming uh, cross-component and cross-functional and also to increase learning. It also will motivate the roles that usually do coordination work to change. Otherwise, there is no real motivation for that. It will also improve the return on investment for customer offerings because if you do that and you, you integrate more frequently, you see the whole product um, more frequently integrated together and you can experience it. You can actually come to a point where you make go and kill decisions more frequent. Like Robert uh, presented today in his, um, in his talk that uh, the company killed um, a product after a few reviews while, uh, because they discovered that it's not uh, valuable. Yeah. So, a release, to, uh, release to customer cycle time um, can highly influence uh, those phases, how you deal with them, because there, if you shorten the, the time, the re release of si uh, the customer cycle time, the, um, how you do research, how you do actually then development, how you uh, release and maintain the stuff becomes easier. Batch sizes become smaller and uh, um, therefore it's fa uh, the, the throughput is faster idea to, uh, to release. Yeah, maybe one um, more example for 
uh, improve the return on invest on, on the customer offerings. And I will pick an example randomly, like a car company, for instance. Um, so imagine a car company and uh, they have a product, a car, and this car usually has uh, a number of functions that you can buy in some sort of package. And um, actually, the functions will be developed because another car company already has this function or is planning to release that function, whatever. But this is not real customer feedback. So I would actually challenge you, but that's probably taking too much time, name five functions your car has that you deliberately bought. Five, oh, three. Maybe one. So this is not, um, so you are actually developing um, from a competition compare perspective rather than from a true customer perspective. And that's um, what we mean just to make sure that uh, return on invest of the customer offerings. Yeah? What does the customer actually want? Does he want yet another uh, uh, function name on some paper that he never reads? I don't think so. So, obvious question, can the benefits of faces be achieved easier? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> like I said, decrease cadence, check progress, uh, and may go kill decisions every iteration. Who prevents you from that? Actually, if you decide to reduce the uh, release to customer cycle time, then you can do that because you then can integrate frequently. You can um, experience the product frequently, and then you can also make the go-kill decisions faster or in shorter iterations. Um, this implies that you, we talked about this, and I think uh, Vaclav, that's his name, right? He said the most important role is the PO, and this obviously implies that a real PO actually exists in the company. Exactly, thank you. And uh, companies are uh, organized around customer-centric requirements. Also, this uh, helps, uh, or actually is uh, unavoidable to organize um, the company around customer-centric requirements in order to achieve um, the benefits without having those uh, face adequate processes and organizational structures. And of course, adaptive technology stack and uh, foster code reuse. If this is in place, um, then it is also possible to uh, just have the normal cycle, the normal iteration to cover all of the uh, benefits or yeah, to solve all the uh, problems that currently are used or solved with face adequate processes and uh, organizational structures. Yeah, I uh, usually say the, the software becomes part of the solution and it's not part of the problem. So sometimes the software is seen as part of the, the problem because it makes things even more complicated, right? But that's just not how it works. It's quite related to what Bas said yesterday. So we want to reward reuse of code. Um, we want to make it very easy, comfortable for the teams to use the stack and improve the stack and innovate the stack. That is stuff that needs to be as easy as possible, right? And hopefully as fun as possible. Exactly. Okay, so um, that was the theoretical part. And because it's already in the evening, we want to engage in a little game with you. And don't worry, you don't have to move too much, but you have to think. So the game is called Anticipation Game. So uh, some of you know Constantine, some of you know me already, so we, you know um, our context, let's, let's call it context. And um, what we want you to do is that you think about your context or your company and what arguments um, could come up that would manifest the faces are inevitable, okay? There are faces in your context. Who would say that? What would they say probably? And what we want the two teams to do, so team blue and team green, 
We want you to write down counter arguments on paper. So you can write it, uh, like stick your heads together on the different uh, tables and just collect your cards physically on the topmost tables. So the table where Niels is sitting, for instance, would be the table for Team Green. And Greg, your table is the table for Team Blue. And what we want you to do is that you have now to guess what we two wrote down on our slides as arguments why there are faces. And you have to counter whatever BS we are coming up with. Okay? And obviously, you have to play your cards, so you have to have a predefined answer. Uh, the best answer wins, and there is Team Purple, so uh, you either rename Team Green to Team Purple, or I will change the slide. We can, we can figure that out. So, you have to anticipate what we probably are going to present to you, and there are, of course, a few rules. Hold on, Frederick. Or not necessarily what we are going to present to you, but what in your context, maybe in your companies, you hear, uh, which arguments you hear uh, when, uh, when uh, people say, well, phases are unav uh, unavoidable. For example, oh, we have now some sort of a death march, so we need to change our process. We cannot do, for example, we cannot use Scrum in, uh, in a death march phase. We need something else. Um, or in a research phase, we cannot use Scrum because we need something else. Okay. There's a few examples. Just a few examples. Um, you may remember some of our examples from the anti-pattern slide. Um, just to set the rules, um, you obviously have to anticipate our challenges. Maximum of 15 words per card. Maximum of five cards. You may not use any of the cards, so once you play your card, the card is burned. You cannot use it again. Uh, you are not forced to play a card. Um, the leading team, so we will keep a score, the leading team has to go first, and if we are in a tie situation, we will play one bonus round, because who wants to share his beer, right? Rules are clear. Any questions regarding the rules or the game? Does, does the, an anticipated argument or the word counter argument count in the 15 words uh, on the card? No. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So, there's one. Is it five cards per person or five cards per no, team? No, five cards per team, unfortunately, yes. So you probably have to somehow find out what is the best card on the front table, let's say. Any other questions? So five cards per team maximum, and we will give you 15 minutes, 15 minutes to come up with your counter arguments, 15 minutes, okay? Starting right now. And Frederick will join one team, I will join another team to ask, uh, to answer questions if anything comes up. Okay, time is up. Please gather five cards on your uh, first table or t the table you're sitting at at the moment. So you've already also got two microphones here for Team Blue and Team Purple. Microphone for Team Purple. Okay, um, while uh, uh, still coming back, obviously um, Konstantin and I will, will be the judges here. And uh, how will we select the best answers? Obviously the more concrete your answer is, the better. Practical use of less principles is always a good thing. Um, propose possible experiments, for instance. Embed your answer in the real world or in your context. Uh, and obviously, as I already said, uh, we will be the judges, okay? So, one additional rule. 
when we present the argument, the teams have 30 seconds to select which card you want to play or if you want to skip. Okay? Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. And I will, <clears throat> I will also tell you, you read it, you read the example, and I will tell you which phase it usually is when we hear such stuff. Okay, so here comes the first challenge. Round one. Our research topics need flexibility and cannot be bothered with industrialization requirements, otherwise the teams are too slow. Hence, we need the early phase to actually find out if the research topics can be put into the product. 30 seconds to select your answer. Running now. This appears obviously in the development phase when some research topics need to be done. So, time is up. And I will just choose randomly the team to start. And Robert, you already have a microphone, so you may start presenting your counter-argument. Um, our counter-argument is uh, you can fix this also with short iterations and transparency. Mm -hmm. Give me the, the card, just to make sure that you're not reusing it. Oh, come on, you can trust <laughs> me. <laughs> okay, team blue. So the, uh, who is accountable for the whole, uh, the problem that we see with this, uh, the counter argument to your uh, statement is that uh, you're not, you don't have a whole product uh, view, but you're looking at uh, an early part uh, untested of the uh, uh, assumption, causing delay in validation, delay in learning for the teams who might work on it, um, uh, uh, hypothetical thinking rather than um, wishful thinking. I think you can only read what's on the card. <laughs> okay, all I can say on the card is who's accountable for the whole. Okay. Now we have to decide. Let me quick. Uh... I have such an urge to give you more counter arguments on that. But... <laughs> no, I'm not going to have somebody else to take it. This okay, so, so the judges concrete. have decided that concrete. you can, because we have to judge based on what's written on the card. So this point goes to Team Purple. For you can fix this also with short iterations and transparency. Uh, so this one is the winning card. This is great because we can use the cards right away. Okay, next one. Round number two. Here comes the argument. The speed of change in the late phase is much quicker than one sprint. Hence, we cannot wait for planning or refactoring events to happen. We need the late phase for that. 30 seconds for your counter arguments, starting now. Okay, so the leading team starts. So uh, who's presenting the counter, the counter argument? Um, so we were more focused on the refactoring part. <laughs> And we would reply, integrating and testing continuously will improve the quality. Gate means rare integration and refactoring improvements. Okay, just give me the card. Thank you. Thanks. This okay. delays end-to-end -end and customer testing, which increase risks. Now the judges. Now the judges. <laughs> Okay, so the judges, we have decided this point goes to Team Blue because it's, uh, it's slightly more onto the actual question than yours. Yours is also valid, obviously, but it's a little... Yeah, <laughs> next time. Okay, okay, so next round. The only time when we can probably plan ahead is after the early phase, before the delivery pressure hits. The events and all that were actually designed for that phase. We can stick to them only in that phase. Before you start the timer, context. 
we talk about here between the uh, research and development phase. 30 seconds. Time is up. So uh, there is currently no leading team. And since you presented last time, I would ask Team Blue to present first. This is great. Oh, sorry. Uh, the world has changed, guys. Now it's faster, more digital, complex, and all methods are failing. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. What is your counter argument? Who, who's presenting? Ah, ah, yeah. So we have like different word for it, but uh, working products released frequently gives you a better control, real control, but control mm -hmm. hence planning. So <laughs> only what's on the card. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so the judges have decided. Uh, this is a point for Team Blue again. Okay, so things is heating up. Round four. All the bugs from our bug tracking tool have to be solved immediately. The amount of reported bugs will rise in the late phase, hence we have to ignore the planning stuff. Otherwise, we cannot solve the problems in time. 30 seconds. Time is up, and since we do have a leading team, Team Blue has to present first. But guys, what if the scope was wrong, and without the customer feedback, it's less likely we will meet customer satisfaction? Hmm. Nice. What's your counter argument? This is the opposite of what all successful companies like Netflix, Google are doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is another point for Team Blue. And I just wanted to point out the, the, this is the opposite of what Google does is a very good argument, especially with management, but this is slightly more precise, which is why we selected it. Okay, so shall we make it more fun? The last round will be worth two points. <laughs> okay, so round five. Without the faces, we are not able to handle the different projects and deliveries we are facing. This will help us to work more efficiently. <laughs> okay, 30 seconds starting now. <laughs> Time is up. The leading team presents first. Team Blue, what's your counter argument? With face, with faces, so with faces, mode uh, causes burnout, attrition, errors, demotivation, finger pointing, and waste and cues. That's that's a lot of things happening. <laughs> wow, we, we we try it our best. What is your counter argument? How uh, we have a question as an answer, then how are we then enforcing empirical process control? Mm hmm. Oh, he's playing the process control card. <laughs> so we actually decided to give that point to Team Green. And it's actually worth two points. So we actually have a tie. If only I would have thought of that. <laughs> so since we have a tie, the team that scored last has to answer first, so that would be you, and the other team, Team Blue, you have to propose a situation from your own experience, and to actually think about that, you have two minutes. Do you have a situation to present? Who's going to present? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Listen carefully. Could, could you please repeat what I have to do? You present the situation similar to the situations before, and this team will answer. 
uh, in our company there is a legal requirement uh, made by the government that we should continue making the faces because the deployment uh, within the company should be done by another department and uh, we have to have uh, uh, the deployment to production been tested by the other teams. That's the legal card and presented quite, uh, you've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so because it's the final round, you get one minute to think about what you want to answer. One minute starting now. Time is up. Who is going to present the answer or do you want to skip? Uh, okay, we understood. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> um, so, but we would like to think a bit to find a way to have something working much quicker than we can monetize and, mark, and um, increase the return on investment much quicker. So you will have a lower risk of just losing uh, time and money because of this so gate regulation you have. No further arguments, no further Have arguments. you ever met Michael from the legal department? No, no, no counter arguments. No counter arguments. So your, your answer is, just to, to, to wrap it up, to find a way to monetize, monetize earlier faster, yes. and faster. Okay, so now we have to think if that is a point or not. Okay, so the beer imported from Munich as an homage to the 2019 LES conference and the grand prize, blah, 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 goes to Team Blue. Congratulations. So that's the handover ceremony and uh, that's why we brought two six packs uh, we were not expecting so many you guys. Uh, did you buy it in 2019? So, <laughs> uh, legal department won't allow me to answer that question. I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, guys, I have one last request. First of all, thank you for playing along. I think I learned quite a lot. Uh, thank you for your attention and. Uh, being good Scrum Masters, we obviously also would love your feedback. So you can go to menti.com and use that code. You can scan this one or you just directly go to this uh, URL. URL and just provide your feedback if you want. This will be uh, on for quite some time. So whenever you have time today, uh, please give us some feedback. Thank you for your time. Uh, that was Phasenangemessenheit. Thank you. Thank you.